Okay, Nick. So I got the uh, thread of the previous space of part one of Revolutionary Suicide. So if anybody wanted to check it out. So this is part two. I'm going to just go ahead and jump in it. Unfortunately, I can't see the space when I read because my head just be in the book. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. All right. So this is six. Uh, this quote is going to be from Martin Delaney, 1852. We love our country, dearly love her, but she does not love us. She despises us. The section is called High School. Throughout high school, I constantly did battle with the instructors. The clashes I had steadily intensified and finally led to my transfer out of the Oakland system for a while. In the 10th grade, I was attending Oakland Technical High School on Broadway and 41st. One day, the teacher sent me to the principal's office for a minor offense I had committed the day before. The principal and teacher agreed that I could come back if I had said nothing in class for the rest of the semester. I had already decided that I wanted out of school entirely, but I tried to sit mutely in class and not violate any of the rules, such as chewing gum or eating sunflower seeds. Oh, that's anti-Black. <laughs> One day I forgot the agreement and raised my hand to ask a question. The teacher blew up. Put your hand down, he said. I don't want to hear any more from you this whole term. I stood up and told him it was impossible to learn anything if I was forbidden to ask questions. Then I walked out of the class. Leaving school then meant I was short of classes and would be unable to go on the 11th grade and graduate. So I went to live in Berkeley with my oldest sister, Myrtle, and transferred to Berkeley High School. Although Oakland was known in the East Bay area as a rough community, it was not until I transferred to Berkeley High School that real trouble started with the police. One Sunday while walking over to a girl's house, I met four or five girls I knew. They asked me to go with them to a party. Although I did not take up their offer, we walked along together. Since we were going the same way, pretty soon a car pulled up carrying a guy named Marvin Carter, he's dead now, and some others. They jumped out and began hassling me about messing around with their girlfriends. I recognized Merv Carter. In fact, I had hung around Berkeley High with him and a couple of his friends. Like everybody else, they were turf conscious and hated to see any outsider making time with their girls. I reminded him that we knew each other and that I was not interfering with the girls and was on my way somewhere else. Anyway, I said, we hang around together in school. He told me we were friends inside school, but not outside. I cannot understand why he said that, whether he meant it or was just trying to impress his buddies. But that time they had dropped a half circle on me. I realized they were going to jump me. So I hit Merv in the mouth and then they all came at me. They beat me up pretty badly, but I refused to fall down. The girls were yelling to me to run, but I would not. No matter how many guys Merv had with him, I meant to stand my ground as long as I could. I was going to look them in the eye and keep going forward. Somebody called the police, but by the time they arrived, Carter and the others had gone, and I was there alone, bleeding and missing several teeth. Although the police tried to find out who did it, I would not tell them anything. I did not want to be an informer because this was a problem between the brothers. The outside racist authorities had nothing to do with it. I have always believed that to inform on someone, to the teacher, to the principal, or the police is wrong. These people represent another world, another racial group. To be white is to have power and authority, and for a black to say anything to them is betrayal. So I did not inform, and they escaped the police, but they could not escape me. The next day I went to school carrying a carpenter's hammer and an old pistol I had swiped from my father. The pistol did not work. It lacked a firing pin, but I had no intention of shooting anybody anyway. At lunchtime, I cold trailed Marvin and about six of his buddies downtown. Catching up with them finally, I started to swing on him with the hammer. I hit him several times, wanting to hurt him, but he rolled with most of the blows and was not hurt too badly. Meanwhile, I forgot I had the gun. When the others began picking up rocks and sticks, I remembered the gun and used it to keep them at bay. This was the only way I could defend myself because I had no friends at Berkeley High School to help me. I could not let them get away with what they had done, particularly since they had falsely accused me of messing with their girlfriends. Somebody called the police again, and when I heard the sirens, I ran farther downtown where I was arrested. I was only about 14 then, 
so they took me to juvenile hall, where I stayed for a month while they investigated my family background. Then I was released to the custody of my parents. This was my first time into anything that could be called criminal. Even though I had raided fruit trees, cracked parking meters, and helped myself to stuff in the neighborhood stores, I never looked upon that as stealing or doing anything illegal, however. To me, that was not taking things that did not belong to us, but getting something really ours, something owed to us. That stealing was merely retribution. When I was released from juvenile hall, Berkeley High School refused to admit me again because my parents lived in Oakland. I went back to Oakland Tech. My friends were there and others who knew me praised what I had done in Berkeley. What I had done was an accepted action under the circumstances. If I had not retaliated, I would have been less respected. Things went along well at Oakland Tech for a change. I was able to handle my differences with the teachers a little better because of my satisfaction with life outside the classroom. My reputation as a fighter kept the wolves away. I was also known as a hipster like my brother Sunnyman, and I liked that too. Some of the kids even called me crazy, but that never bothered me because they used to call my father that. To me, crazy was a positive identity. When I got my first car, it did a lot to help to help my crazy reputation. My father gave me one that had a lot of spots on it from primer paint. Melvin named it the Gray Roach. We would pile into it and go riding, looking for girls or some action. My friends did not like the way I drove, which led to any number of arguments and fights. <laughs> Since there were so few cars available to joyride in, they had little choice. Sometimes I backed up as fast as I could down a whole block, and when we reached a corner, I would jam on the brakes. The guys would fall out the car yelling. Sometimes fights started right there. At railroad crossings, when the guardrail was down to signal an approaching train, I kept right on driving around the guardrail and over the tracks. I had several near misses, and as soon as we crossed the tracks, everyone would pile out of the car again, arguing and fighting. When the fights were over, our friendships were stronger than ever. They respected me. They even, I'm sorry, even though they thought I was crazy, I thought I could outmaneuver anybody, anything, and never passed up a chance to try. Since I always won, I soon believed that I could always defeat the invincible and the powerful the way David defeated mm -hmm. Goliath. Eventually, in my ride, I believed that I could outmaneuver death. I have never feared death. The escape from finitude was an idea that came to me after I saw the movie Black Ophrius. I loved that film and saw it many times, although I thought the outcome would have been different had it been my life. Whereas Orpheus flirted with death and died, I had been in lots of conflicts near death on many occasions, but had always come out alive. Since I had not been killed, I guess I concluded that I could not be killed. Orpheus too attempts to outmaneuver death, even though the history of mankind proves that death always wins. In spite of this, the only way that Orpheus can maintain his dignity is to be unafraid and attempt to outmaneuver his oppressor. This seems characteristic of human experience, for although all of us are sentenced to death each day, we try desperately to get away from it. If we cannot, we try to put it off by acting in a manner that discredits death and eliminates our fear of it. This is our victory. Black Orpheus demonstrates an even more profound truth that it is possible to circumvent death though the heritage that one generation passes on to another. At the end of the film, the little girl is dancing while the little boy plays Orpheus' guitar. Though Orpheus was his, I'm sorry, though Orpheus and his woman are dead, her dance is a victory over death. The new generation survives and the sun still rises. The world does not stop because death has crushed a beautiful and significant part of it. Orpheus had passed on his guitar to the little boy. This means of sustaining life raises the sun again. I held on to the idea that I was immune to death for a long time. I still do not fear the end, but I no longer believe that I cannot be killed. Life has taught me that it is an ever-present possibility. Too many of my comrades have died in the past few years to let me feel that my last day will never come. Even so, I tell the comrades you can only die once, so do not die a thousand times worrying about it. Around this time, some people got the notion that I had metaphysical, uh, mystical powers. I began to put various friends and acquaintances into hypnotic trances, mostly at parties or in some of the rap sessions with brothers on the block. I learned the technique first from Melvin, who had been taught by Solomon Hill. 
a fellow student at Oakland City College. Later, I studied hypnosis techniques on my own and began and became pretty good at it. It is easy to learn, but dangerous. Just learning a technique does not teach you all you should know when you are dealing with a person's mind. You can easily hurt someone. I guess I have put over 200 people into trances at various times. I gave them post-hypnotic suggestions to eat grass, bark like a dog, or crawl over the floor like a baby. And sometimes I suck pins and needles into their flesh. Once I used auto-hypnosis and put myself into a trance. When Melvin put a red-hot cigarette on my arm, I did not move or feel any pain, although he burned me pretty badly. This incident impressed a lot of people, but Melvin was pretty upset about it. Far from using hypnosis in a destructive way, I used it for styling in the community. As my reputation grew, the novelty wore off and finally I stopped because it was no longer interesting. When I was not putting people into trances or racing around in the gray roach <laughs> and driving wine with the brothers, I was standing in a crowd of people at parties reciting poetry. My problem was that I could not dance and when the music began, I felt self-conscious. If I did not leave when the dancing started, I would begin discussions or recite poetry. By the time I reached high school, I was really very good at remembering the poetry I heard read out loud. Much of it was poetry that Melvin had taught me. David's favorite was the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Whenever I recited at parties or got people into deep conversations, everyone would stop dancing and gather around. Some of them would ask me to recite things I had memorized. The host or hostess usually became angry when people stopped dancing. And often I would be asked to sit down and shut up or split. This usually signaled the beginning of a fight. Somehow, I managed to stay in Oakland Tech until I graduated, despite my continued defiance of the authorities. They tried to down me for many years, but I knew inside that I was a good person, and the only way I could hold on to any self-esteem was to resist and to defy them. Everything they opposed, I supported. That was how I first became a supporter of Fidel Castro in the Cuban Revolution. Earlier, when I heard teachers reciting Paul Robeson, I defended him and believed in him, even though I knew very little about his life. When they started putting down Castro and the revolution of the Cuban people, I knew it must be good too. I became an advocate of the Cuban revolution. My high school diploma was a farce. When my friends and I graduated, we were ill-equipped to function in society, except at the bottom, even though the system said we were educated. Maybe they knew that they were what they were doing, preparing us for the trash heap of society, where we would have to work long hours for low wages. They never realized how much they had actually educated me by teaching me the necessity of resistance and the dignity of defiance. I was on my way to becoming a revolutionary. So this is part two. I began to question what I had always taken for granted. I'm going to read this quote from the autobiography of Malcolm X. I knew right there in prison that reading had changed forever the course of my life. As I see it today, the ability to read awoke inside me some long dominant craving to be mentally alive. My homemade, edu my homemade education gave me with, very, with every additional book I read, a little bit more sensitivity to the deafness, dumbness, and blindness that was affecting the black race in America. That was Malcolm X. Reading. By the time I had reached my last year of high school, I was a functional, functional illiterate. Melvin was in college and doing very well. I felt that I could do it too, but when I talked to a counselor about it, he made the mistake of telling me I was not college material. I set out to prove them wrong. First, I had to learn to read. The school authorities told me not only that I was not college material because of my performance in school, but also that I was not intelligent enough to do college work. According to the Stanford Bennett test, I had an IQ of 74. They felt justified in discouraging me. I knew I could do anything I wanted to. That was how I maintained my self-respect. I wanted to go to college. So my defiance of their opinion, as well as my admiration for Melvin, were incentives for me to learn to read. I knew I would have to read well in order to make it in college. I also knew that it would be difficult to find someone to teach me because I was embarrassed. I decided to teach myself. My key was the poetry I had learned to recite. I knew plenty of words, but could not yet recognize them in print. 
Using Melvin's poetry books, I began to study the poems I knew, associating the sounds in my head with the words on the page. Yo, that hit so hard because <laughs> I don't know if y'all could tell listening to like these recorded spaces, but that's literally me. <laughs> like I've heard these words before, so I can recognize them sometimes. But yeah, I learned to read late because I dropped out the eighth grade. <laughs> Real talk. I'm not even going to front. But yeah, I love his honesty. Uh, let's see. Then I picked up Melvin's copy of Plato's Republic, bought a dictionary, and started learning to read things I did not already know. The Republic seemed a logical choice. I wanted to join Melvin and his friends in their intellectual conversations. It was a long and painful process, but I was determined. Lee Edward had taught me to look them in the eye and keep ab advancing. They said I was not college material, so I was advancing on them. I spent long hours every day at home going through the Republic and announcing the words I knew. I'm sorry, pronouncing the words I knew. If I did not know a word, I would look it up in the dictionary, learn how to sound it out if I could, and then learn the meaning. Proper names and Greek words were difficult and soon began to ignore them. Day after day, <laughs> you know, I do the same. <laughs> day after day for eight or nine hours at a time, I worked on that book, going over it page by page, word by word. I had no help from anyone because I did not want it. Embarrassment overwhelmed me. My mother loved reading and devoured books. Here I was an adult who could not read as my father, my mother, and Melvin could. I felt so low I stayed in my room where nobody could see what I was doing, poring over the words, using a dictionary on every single line, and memorizing the sounds and the meanings. Once or twice I asked Melvin to pronounce a word for me or explain it. He was shocked that I could not recognize some of them, and at first, I think disgusted. That hurt. His disgust could not compare with my own. He said that not knowing how to read was a very bad thing, but I knew by then, and I knew, but I knew that by then, and his disapproval made it even more difficult to learn. My sense of shame had kept me from seeking help earlier. Now it became impossible for me to ask. I had to do it by myself. It seems to me that nothing is more painful than a sense of shame that overwhelms you and afflicts the soul. The pain may not even be your fault, but it can still be very acute. It hurts more when you know that there is no natural process as in the body whereby the pain will go away. You have to relieve it with your own strength of will, your own discipline and determination. I had been hurt many times in fights, but nothing equaled the pain I felt at not being able to read. The pain from fighting went away in time. The shame I felt would not go away. I do not know how long it took me to go through Plato the first time, probably several months. When I finally finished, I started over again. I was not trying to deal with the ideas or concepts, just learning to recognize the words. I went through the book about eight or nine times before I felt I had mastered the material. Later on, I studied the Republic in college. By then, I was prepared for it. When I began to read, a whole new world opened up to me. I became interested in books. I still could not read very well, but each new book made it easier. I did not mind spending, hour, spending many hours because reading was enjoyment rather than work. When I reached this point, I accumulated books and read one after another. I did this all through my senior year in high school and the summer following. By the time I really knew my way through a book, I had graduated from high school. This is a quote from Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man. All my life, I have been looking for something, and everywhere I turned, someone tried to tell me what it was. I accepted their answers, too, though they were often in contradiction, even self-contradictory. I was naive. I was looking for myself and asking everyone except myself questions which I, and only I, could answer. It took me a long time and much painful boomeranging of my expectations to achieve a realization everyone else appears to have been born with that I am nobody but myself. The section's called Moving On. About two years before I completed high school, my inner life was plunged into a sea of confusion and turmoil that lasted until Bobby Seale and I organized the Black Panther Party. Four years, I went through the kind of pain that comes when you are letting go of a old beliefs and certainties and have nothing to take their place. This distress had began early earlier and was a result of contrasting and varying elements in my life. As I matured 
Physically, the problem seemed more insoluble. The strain became greater. I felt adrift. I began to question everything about my life. There seemed no haven of security in, in anything I was doing or hoping to do. I questioned my religious activities and my search for God. I questioned whether school was worth the effort. Most of all, I questioned what was happening in my own family and in the community around me. My father's struggle with bills was common in many of the families of my comrades. He had worked hard all his life, only to sink more deeply into debt. It seemed that no matter how hard he worked and sacrificed for his family, it led to more work. Things never became easier. I began to ask why this had happened to us and to everybody around us. Why could my father never get out of debt? If hard work brought success, why did we not see more success in the community? The people were certainly working hard. It seemed we were predestined to endless toil. We poor people never reached a point of having time to pursue the things we wanted. We had neither leisure time nor material goods. Not only did I want to know why this was so, I wanted to avoid a similar fate. While I was looking for answers to the questions of family and religion, I was also thinking of joining a monastery, not so much out of religious conviction as for the isolation and time to examine these questions in peace. I felt the need to have a place where I could examine things without interference. Isolation would shield me from the troubles that were suffocating my father and my family, but I did not entertain the idea very seriously and soon gave it up. I began to think that Melvin's approach through books was one way to examine these questions. His life required a certain amount of detachment from the community, and that was attractive to me. On the other hand, there was my brother Sunny Man. For a long time, I had believed that he had the freedom I was seeking. He had possessions galore, no bills, and was defying the authorities and getting away with it. Even so, I came to the conclusion that he had not so much defied the authorities as compromised with them. All the hipsters with cars, clothes, and money have rejected the family relationship that I valued so highly. They had achieved a level of freedom at great personal cost. To me, this was not freedom, but another form of subjugation to the oppressor. Even if Sunny Man had escaped their control, his life did not answer my questions. It did not help me understand why most Blacks never gained the freedom that, seemed, that he seemed to have. I finally decided that Sunny Man and his comrades did not have the power to determine their destiny. They operated through someone else's power, the oppressors, and they were not free as long as they had to reject some part of themselves. The religious beliefs acquired in childhood also troubled me. After struggling through some of Socrates' work as well as those of Aristotle, human description, I don't know how to say that word, sorry, y'all. <laughs> I began to question what I had always taken for granted. The ideas in the phil philosophical works that Melvin was studying spilled over into my confused mind. All the while, I felt damned. To question religion was a profane, her heretical act that went against every moral tenet I had known at home. I identified very strongly with Stephen Dallas and James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man because he went through a similar experience. He felt great guilt when he first questioned Catholicism, believing that he would be consumed by the fires of hell for his doubt. In a way, that is what happened to me. The struggle with religious faith is a difficult experience to describe because it involves many things that are either repressed earlier in life or not understood. In the process, the fears that are not related to religious beliefs are released. By then, you no longer have any protection from your religion, and you have to start dealing with your dread. The real world closes in on you, cutting off traditional comforts like a simple prayer. Eventually, you and you alone have to deal with troubling questions. This always leads to anxiety. There is nothing, so you are free and terrified. In a way, the turmoil and conflict I was experiencing were a kind of madness with no way out. The patterns that appealed to me as answers to my questions were closed to me. Sunny Man represented an attractive way of life, but it did not provide the answers I was seeking. Melvin was into another appealing pattern, but I had never been able to handle school effectively. I was confused. Sunny Man had an illusion of freedom. Melvin had an approach, but I could not read. Nobody had any answers for me. Sometimes I went one way and sometimes another. I never expressed these feelings to my parents. 
I had such respect and admiration for my father, who had done so much for us, that I could not openly question his life. He would not have understood what I was going through. I was grateful, I was appreciative, and I loved and admired him, but I had questions not easily answered. When my high school years came to an end, these doubts and troubles were at a high pitch. They were still with me when I started Oakland City College in the fall of 1959 and were reflected in the new way of life I was beginning. My lifestyle alarmed my parents. They must have sensed my inner turmoil because they began to object strenuously to certain things I was doing. It was the beatnik era in the Bay Area and I grew a beard. To my parents, a beard meant a bohemian and my father insisted that I shave it off. I refused. Because he was accustomed to wielding total authority in our family, my refusal was a serious family violation. My father pressed me again to shave. I continued to resist. The climax came abruptly one night when he confronted me with an ultimatum. ultimatum. To shave right then and there, I told him I would not do it. He struck me, and I ran to him, grabbing him with the bear hug to restrain his arms, and then pushing him away. He chased me out of the house, but I could run much faster. I also knew that I was strong enough to overpower him, but I would never have done that. I just fled. My love for my father had clashed with the need for independence, symbolized by the beard. Knowing I could not return without shaving, I decided to move out. While my father was at work the next day, I packed my things and moved in with a friend, Richard Thorne. For years, a room was kept for me in my father's house, and periodically, I returned home for short periods of time. Our differences mellowed and eventually disappeared. My room in my parents' house was not considered given up until 1968, when I was sentenced, sentenced to prison. Let me grab some water. This quote is by Melvin Van Peebles, Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death. It says, Black is not only beautiful, it's bad too. It's fast, classy, name-taking, and ass-kicking too. <laughs> this section is called College and the Afro-American Association. In 1959, when I started at Oakland City College, now Merritt College, it was a junior college located in North Oakland, surrounded by the Black community. Many local Black people attended at that time, and I joined the crowd. College for me was more than books and lectures and classes, although they were important. For one thing, I never really left my neighborhood, and I still ran with the brothers on the block. Any money I had came from petty crime, an old pattern with me. This, however, became a time for making new friends and joining organizations that started me in new directions. One of my first friends at Oakland City College was Richard Thorne. Richard was a very tall, very black fellow who even then, prior to the Black Cultural Revolution, wore his hair natural. His appearance caused awe in some people and frightened others. He knew how to excite these feelings and how to exert an influence over those around him. I stayed with Richard for about a month after I left home before I moved into Poor Boys Hall. Poor Boys Hall was behind a bookstore from the college. The owners had converted a big storage warehouse into a dormitory with rooms, not really rooms, but stalls with thin plywood dividers. A stall rented for 15 a month. I loved being around Poor Boys Hall because most of my friends among the rumors were young fellows just beginning to get their thing together. Like me, they were searching. Some of them have gone on to become a part of the system, while others have been further victimized. I kept up close contact with Richard Thorne, too, and we spent a lot of time together at his apartment. Richard usually had several girls around and was always talking about the two or three books he intended to write. I was more interested in the girls. <laughs> Richard had a theory about intimate human relations. He saw non-possessive love as pure love, the only love, and possessive love as a mockery of pure love. Non-possessive love did not enslave or constrain the love object. Richard was critical of what he called bourgeois love relationships, of the marriage system and the requirements of the marriage partners to each other, i.e. sex with one partner, jealousy, limits upon mobility, well-defined roles based upon sex. He felt that people should not be like cars or houses. No man should own a wife, nor should a wife own a husband, because ownership is predicated upon control, fences, barriers, constraints, and psychological tyranny. 
Non-possessive love is based upon shared experiences and friendship. It is the kind of love we have for our bodies, for our thumb or foot. We love ourselves, our bodies, but we do not want to enslave any part of ourselves. Richard and I engaged in some deep discussions. Sometimes we stayed at his house for days talking about the general situation, cursing the white man for everything and drinking wine. <laughs> That's a good time. When I tried, when I tired of these sessions, I made it down to the block to be with the righteous street brothers. <laughs> I was an angry young man at this time, drinking wine and fighting on the block, burglarizing homes in the Berkeley Hills and going to school at Oakland City College. I was moving away from family and church, which had offered me so much comfort in earlier days and was looking for something new. The questions I asked during this period were so disturbing that I acted outrageously to drive them away. I was looking for something more tangible with which to identify. I saw all my turmoil in terms of racism and exploitation and the obvious discrepancies between the haves and have nots. I was trying to figure out how to avoid being crushed and losing respect for myself, how to keep from embracing the oppressor that had already maimed my family and community. In the discussions at Phi Beta Sigma, a social fraternity I joined for a while, I expressed my anger about society and white racism. The others told me that I sounded like a guy named Donald Warden who was preaching blackness at the Berkeley campus of the University of California. He was the head of an organization called Afro-American Association. I went to Berkeley to find Warden and hear what he was saying. The first member I met though was Maurice Dawson, one of Warden's tight partners. He turned me off with his arrogance. I had come searching for something and he scorned me because I did not already know what I was seeking, okay? I could not understand what he was saying about Afro-Americans. The term was new to me. Dawson really put me down. You know what an Afro-Cuban is? Yes. You know what an Afro-Brazilian is? Yes. Then why don't you know what an Afro-American is? Damn, okay, excuse me. <laughs> it may have been apparent to him, but not to me, but I was still interested. <laughs> Maurice taught me a lesson that I try to apply to the Black Panther Party today. I dissuade party members from putting down people who do not understand. Even people who are unenlightened and seemingly bourgeois should be answered in a polite way. Things should be explained to them as fully as possible. I was turned off by a person who did not want to talk to me because I was not important enough. Maurice just wanted to preach to the converted who already agreed with him. I try to be cordial because that way you win people over. You cannot win them over by drawing the line of de demarcation, saying you are on this side and, my, and I'm on the other. That shows a lack of consciousness. After the Black Panther, Panther oh, sorry, y'all. After the Black Panther Party was formed, I nearly fell into this error. I would not understand why people were blind to what I saw so clearly. Then I realized that their understanding had to be developed. I started going to meetings of the Afro-American Association whose purpose was mainly to develop a sense of pride among Black people for their heritage, their history, and their contributions to culture and society. Donald Warden, a lawyer from the University of California at Berkeley, has started it. Most of the meetings were book discuss discussion groups, which I enjoyed because by then I was relating to more books, I'm oh, sorry, I was relating to books more and more. I began reading books about Black people, and every Friday, we sat up half the night discussing them. We read The Souls of Black Folks by W.E. Du Bois, uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Men, Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington, and The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. I was one of the first 10 to join the organization. On Saturday afternoons, we would go into the Black community in Oakland or San Francisco and speak on the street corners, running down the racist system. People came to listen because they were bored and wanted some entertainment not because Warren's words were relevant to their lives. I started to bring more of the poor, uneducated brothers off the block into the association. Most of the people in the association were college students and very bourgeois, but my people were off the block. Some of them could not even read, but they were angry and looking for a way to channel their feelings. Warden was glad to have the Lumpen brothers along. He needed some strong armed men who would just follow instructions without question. Some brothers and I formed a bodyguard for him. Sometimes our street meetings on Saturdays ended in fights because white boys came around looking for trouble. That was, that was when I began to see through Warden. My family thought that Warden was up to no good and they were quite unhappy when I joined him. 
They said that he was interested only in building up his law office. I'm sorry, his law practice. But I had to find out for myself. My disillusionment began when I realized he would not stand his ground in a fight. Once in a San Francisco meeting, some white guys yelled at us from a window and then came down to fight. I was throwing hands, trying to protect Warden, and when I looked up, he had run off, leaving us there by ourselves. Punk ass bitch. But my real decision to quit the group came after I observed Warden in a debating situation where his training and skill should have put him in a superior position. The Oakland Tribune ran an article reporting how the city council had made derogatory remarks about the association. Warden wrote and asked to be placed on the agenda of their next meeting. About 20 of us went down to City Hall expecting Warden to take them to task. We were eighth on the agenda. And when our turn came, Mayor John Holohan, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, who later went to jail for embezzlement, said that we could not speak then because some important people were there from Piedmont, an all-white upper-class area within the city limits of Oakland. Houlihan told us to wait until last, even though it was our turn on the agenda. I thought Warden would object, but no, he just bowed his head, and I thought I saw him shuffle a little. Mm. After the Piedmont merchants made their presentation, Houlihan declared the agenda closed because there was time to consider only 10 items. He told us to write to city council and say our piece. One of the councilmen insisted we be heard. However, since we had written to them in accordance with the rules and had been properly placed on the agenda, Don still had not taken a position. When he rose to speak, he started by saying we were there because the Tribune had reported some derogatory remarks made about us at the council's last meeting. He denied that the Afro-American Association wanted trouble. The association, he said, wanted an end to the lethar lethargy, I hope I said that right, of Black people, to get them off welfare, make them clean themselves up and sweep their streets in a big self-help effort. He said he wanted Black people to stop lying around collecting unemployment checks. God damn. That was when I decided that my parents were right about him. You fucking right. Afterward, the whole city council, including Mayor Houlihan, patted Warden, Warden on the back. He ate it up. <laughs> Ew. In our own meetings, with no white people around, he really took them apart. But he had little interest in black people. He was interested in getting Barry, Barry Goldwater's daughter to contribute money to his sister's little sewing shop, which he claimed was a clothing factory. Goldwater's daughter became an honorary member of the Afro-American Association. I was really sick when I saw what went down before the city council. Warden talked about Black folks as if we were a lazy bunch of people who hated ourselves and had no will to better our own situation. He said nothing about causes, although in that city council room, he was speaking to some of the major causes of Black people suffering in the city of Oakland. Preach. Disillusioned, I left the organization, but not before I had gotten a lot out of it. For one thing, I began to learn about the Black past, but I could not accept Warren's refusal to deal with the Black present. He was obviously interested in building his law practice and routinely began street meetings by saying that he did not have to be there, that he was Phi Beta Kappa and a lawyer. A lot of people who went to him for legal services found him out. They thought he would charge less money being one of them, but he charged high fees. I went to him once and he charged me I'm sorry, he charged more than double the usual fee. Another attorney asked 250, but Warden wanted $750 before he even stepped into the courtroom. He offered the community solutions that solved nothing. I could have accepted this if he had been ignorant, but I believe he knew what he was doing. At least he knew what the popular position was. That is why I tell the Black Panther Party that we must never take a stand just because it's popular. We must analyze the situation objectively and take the logically correct position, even though it may be unpopular. If we are right in the dialects of the situation, our position will prevail. Warden was just the opposite. He rode the tide, even if it went against the community. He talked of a mass exodus to Africa and never believed in it. He maintained that capitalism in general, and Black capitalism in particular, was the best economic system. The only thing wrong with it, he said, was the racism in the system. He never spoke of the link between capitalist exploitation and racism. Wanting whites to believe that blacks were behind him, Warren talked up black power and black history, using the people to gain their support. Downtown, 
He looked for whites to support him out of their fear of organized blacks. Warden gathered the people around him to lead them like sheep. That is what he did at the city council. He is the only black man I know with two weekly radio programs and one television. The mass media, the oppressors, give him public exposure for only one reason. He will lead the people away from the truth of their situation. Others also drifted away from the Afro-American Association. Richard Thorne was in it for a while, but he left to find, he left to found the Sexual Freedom League. Later, he organized a spiritual cult called Om Eternal and changed his name to Om. He is now that cult's unquestioned high priest, God. Another member of the Afro-American Association, I'm sorry, yeah, the Afro-American Association at the time was a skinny, bright, and articulate fellow called Ron Everett. He went from the association to Watts in Los Angeles, where he established his own cultural nationalist group, us, which eventually became a cult. He called himself Karanga. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be getting into this. The original. Later, the <laughs> later the Black Panthers had some bitter confrontations with us, and they killed two of our finest comrades. Uh, this is a quote from Langston Hughes, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers, end quote. Learning. Life was opening up for me. I was trying to relate to Donald Warden and his program, trying to stay close with my righteous partners on the block and also attending Oakland City College on a come and go basis. My motivation had been to prove to my high school teachers that they were wrong about me. To my surprise, I found myself enjoying the learning process and tremendously stimulated by ideas I encountered. Since I had studied classical piano for almost seven years, I took music appreciation, music history, music theory, and also art appreciation, art history. Most semesters, I started out with the regular load, but if something came up in class that excited my imagination, I sometimes skipped classes and gathered as many books and materials as I could find on the subject and stayed in the library or at home in my apartment reading. While studying psychology, for example, I became fascinated with the principle of stimulus response and the biological uh, behaviorism of John B. Watson. I read a number of books on the subject, works by B. F. Skinner and Pavlov, and read about their studies and theories of personality and human development. By the time I was satiated with stimulus response or whatever, the class had moved on to another unit that was of no interest to me. Philosophy was another favorite subject. I still remember some of the issues raised in logic class 13 years ago, such points as the difference between le lexical and stipulative definitions I use in discussions today. Even now, I find it difficult to enter into a dialogue on philosophy or Black Panther ideology until there is agreement on basic definitions. This presents problems when I speak on college campuses. I try to lead an audience into rational and logical discussions, but Many students are looking for rhetoric and phrase mongering. They either do not want to learn or they do not believe that they can think. I was also impressed with A.J. Ayer's logical positivism, particularly his distinction between three kinds of statements, the analytical statement, the synthetic statement, and statements of assumption. These ideas have helped me to develop my own thinking and ideology. Ayer once stated, Nothing can be real if it cannot be conceptualized, articulated, and shared. That notion stuck with me and became very important when I began to use the ideological method of dialectical materialism as a worldview. The ideology of the Black Panther stands on that premise and proceeds on that basis to conceptualize, articulate, and share. Some key aspects of Black Panther ideology and rhetoric, like all power to the people and the concept of pig, developed out of that. They were not haphazardly introduced into our thinking or vocabulary. While studying philosophy, I realized that I had been moving for some time toward existentialism. I read Camus, I'm going to mispronounce all of these names. <laughs> I read Camus, Satir, and, whew, all right, here we go, Kierkegaard, Lord, and saw that their teachings were similar to lessons I had learned from the book of, I should know this word because it's in the Bible. <laughs> I'm not even doing it, y'all. Skipping it in the Bible. Actually, the preacher was the first existentialist. 
all things can't all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him the sacrifice, and to him with sacrifice, not as oh, I'm sorry, sacrifice, <laughs> to him that sacrifice, and to him that sacrifice not, as the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. From then on, I began to engage friends in existentialist discussions. If a brother was hungry, I would say that it is all the same, whether you are hungry or full, whether you are cold or warm, it is all the same. They really thought I was crazy. Then I began living like an existentialist, hitchhiking to Los Angeles and back, walking to the class dirty without shoes and sometimes soaked to the skin from the rain. It was all the time. It was all the same to me. One way or another, I kept my reputation going. All the time I was on the streets, I read, damn, this word again. I'm going to just have to struggle through it. E cap. It's like right there. I just can't remember how to say this word. I recognize it. So I'm just going to skip it <laughs> at least once a month. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> you could tell I dropped out the eighth grade, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Until I was sentenced to the penitentiary where they refused me all reading material. I was still questioning, although college work did not give me answers as such. I was beginning to comprehend human beings and the universe to feel I could develop answers that suited my own experience and my knowledge of the world. Then, too, I was just convincing myself that they had been wrong about me in public schools. When that teacher told me to write business on the board and she wanted to show the class that I was stupid, when they discouraged me from going to college, it was because they thought I was stupid. As a matter of fact, some of my college teachers thought I was stupid, too, because I never did well on those silly little tests they gave us. One psychology teacher told me that I scored at the level of a dull normal an IQ test on an IQ test. Since I really liked this teacher, that hurt me badly. Then he gave another test, which he said indicated that I was intelligent. Only I knew that was what was happening inside of me. Only I knew what was happening between me and those books up in my apartment. I was learning and learning well. I could think, I could read, I could retain the most difficult ideas. For over 12 years, they had tried to knock me down, but I kept getting up, and now I was advancing on them. What I learned from Sunny Man also helped me to acquire an education. I was free to pursue my education in my own style because I could support myself with activities on the block. Most important, I did not have to work. I ran gambling sessions at my apartment serving as the houseman. This meant that I set up the games, cards, or craps for everybody else to participate in and then took a cut of the winnings. It was my studying and reading in college that led me to become a socialist. The transformation from a nationalist to a socialist was a slow one, although I was around a lot of Marxists. I even attended a few meetings of the Progressive Labor Party, but nothing was happening there, just a lot of talk and dogmatism unrelated to the world I knew. I supported Castro all the way. I even accepted an invitation to visit Cuba and recruited others for the trip, but I never made it. When I presented my solutions to the problems of Black people or when I expressed my philosophy, people said, well, isn't that socialism? Some of them were using the socialist label to put me down, but I figured that if this was socialism, then socialism must be a correct view. So I read more of the works of socialists and began to see a strong similarity between my beliefs and theirs. My conversion was complete when I read the four volumes of Mao Zedong to learn more about the Chinese revolution. It was my life plus independent reading that made me a socialist, nothing else. True that. That's the same for me. <laughs> All the books I've ever read were after I dropped out of school. <laughs> dropped out of middle school. And they were all revolutionary. I became convinced, well, revolutionary in poems. I love poetry. I became convinced of the benefits of collectivism and collectivist ideology. 
I also saw the link between racism and the economics of capitalism, although despite the link, I recognized that it was necessary to separate the concepts in analyzing the general situation. In psychological terms, racism could continue to exist even after the economic problems that have created racism have been resolved. Never convinced that destroying capitalism would automatically destroy racism, I felt, however, that we could not destroy racism without wiping out its economic foundation. It was necessary to think much more creatively and independently about these complex interconnections. Even though I liked my lectures and the discussions, I did not identify with the lifestyle on campus. As soon as I finished my classes, I would go down to the block, sometimes to Sacramento Street in Berkeley, or over into West or East Oakland and drink wine, gamble, and fight. More than once, I came from the block to class dead drunk. I never minded being drunk in class because ideas were more intoxicating. But I had instructors who hated having anyone go to the bathroom while they were lecturing. It disturbed them. But when you are full of wine, you just cannot hold your urine. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> College was enjoyable, largely because I was not forced to go. This made it different from high school. I could go to school or stay in my apartment and read. Some days I went to a movie or stayed on the block. I started each semester setting my own pace, which often included a trip to Mexico or to jail or dropping out. And all along, I learned a great deal. In spite of the learning, I was still searching for answers to other questions. The Afro-American Association had been a deep disappointment. I had often felt that it was nothing more than a training ground for the Muslims. Warden seemed to have adopted a lot of their styles and rhetoric. I began to investigate them more closely. I had read C. Eric Lincoln's book, Black Muslims in America, but what attracted me most was Minister Malcolm X. I first heard Malcolm X speak at McClemens High School in Oakland when he attended a conference sponsored by the Afro-American Association on the mind of the ghetto. Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, was with Malcolm, and he told about his con conversions to Islam. He was not yet the heavyweight champion. Malcolm X impressed me with his logic and with his disciplined and dedicated mind. Here was a man who combined the world of the streets and the world of the scholar, a man so widely read he could give better lectures and cite more evidence than many college professors. He was so practical. Dressed in the loose-fitting style of a strong prison man, he knew what the street brothers were like, and he knew what had to be done to reach them. Malcolm had a program armed defense when attacked, and reaching to people with ideas and programs that speak to their condition. At the same time, he identified with the causes of their condition instead of blaming the people. I started going to the Muslim mosque in both Oakland and San Francisco, although not regularly. However, I knew a number of Muslims and talked to them fairly often. I did read their paper regularly to follow the speeches and ideas of Malcolm. I would have joined them, but I could not deal with their religion. By this time, I had had enough of religion and could not bring myself to adopt another. I needed a more concrete understanding of social conditions. References to God or Allah did not satisfy my stubborn questioning. Grab some water. Back at the college, Kenny Freeman, along with Isaac Moore, Doug Allen, Ernie Allen, Alex Papillion and some others had began to organize the West Coast branch of RAM, the Revolutionary Action Moment, Movement. They claimed to function as an underground movement, but instead of revolutionary action, they indulged in a lot of the revolutionary talk, none of it underground. They were all college students with bourgeois skills who wrote a lot. Eventually, they became so infiltrated with agents and I'm sorry, so infiltrated with agents that when an arrest was made, the police spent all their time showing each other their badges. God. Bob Seal tried to get me into the RAM chapter, but the members refused to accept me. They said I lived in Oakland Hills and was too bourgeois, which was an absolute lie. All my life, I have lived in the flatlands. Actually, I think I threatened them because I could use my head but could also get down. Like the Street Brothers, they claimed to be dedicated to the armed overthrow of the government, when in reality, most of them were headed for professional occupations within the system. Freeman and the other RAM members eventually excluded Bobby because he lacked bourgeois skills. RAM formed a front group on campus, the Soul Students Advisory Council, and Kenny Freeman stacked it with his boys. I became very active in it, joining the main thrust to get a course in Negro history into the curriculum. 
We held street meetings outside the college and met with administrators who offer foolish reasons about why Negro history should not be offered. Most of them came down to the belief that Black people had no history to teach. We eventually brought about a few changes, not many, and for a short while, Graham seemed very engaging to me. I considered it the answer to many things I was searching for and felt fulfilled when I talked with others about the African past and what we had contributed to the world. All the groups I went through had this had that in common. Everyone from Warden and the Afro-American Association to Malcolm X and the Muslims to all the other groups active in the Bay Area at that time believed strongly that the failure to include Black history in the college curriculum was a scandal. We all set out to do something about it. The Seoul Students Advisory Council lacked any real depth. And when we succeeded in getting the Black history class on campus, we had nothing else to do. There were the usual parties and other social activities, but these had no real meaning for me and provided no satisfaction. Uh, this is another quote from Elliot Libo, uh, Tally's Corner. As for the future, the young street corner man has a fairly good picture of it. It is a future in which everything is uncertain except the ultimate destruction of his hopes and the eventual realization of his fears. The most he can reasonably look forward to is that these things do not come too soon. Mm. Damn. The Brothers on the Block. Nothing we had done on the campus related to the conditions of the Brothers on the Block. Nothing helped them to gain a better understanding of those conditions. As I saw so many of my friends on their way to becoming dropouts from the human family, I wanted to see something good happen to them. They were getting married and beginning to have babies. Ahead of them were the rounds of jobs and bills my father had gone through. It was almost like being on an urban plantation, a kind of modern day sharecropping. You worked hard, brought in your crop, and you were always in debt to the landholder. The Oakland brothers worked hard and brought in a salary, but they were still in perpetual debt to the stores that provided them with the necessities of life. The Seoul Students Advisory Council ran the Muslims and the Afro-American Association were not offering these brothers and sisters anything concrete, much less a program to help them move against the system. It was agonizing to watch the brother move down those dead end streets. The street brothers were important to me and I could not turn away from the life I shared with them. There was in them an astringent hostility uh, toward all those sources of authority that has such a dehumanizing effect on the community. In school, the system was a teacher, but on the block, the system was everything that was not a positive part of the community. My comrades on the block continued to resist that authority, and I felt that I could not let college pull me away, no matter how attractive education was. These brothers had the sense of harmony and communion. I needed to maintain that part of myself not totally crushed by the schools and other authorities. At Oakland City College, many of the Blacks were working as hard as they could to become a part of the system. I could not relate to their goals. These brothers still believed in making it in the world. They talked about it loud and long, expressing the desires for families, houses, cars, and so forth. Even at that time, I did not want those things. I wanted freedom, and possessions meant non-freedom to me. It was a complex scene. Sonny Man was involved only with the brothers who did not go to college. His friends, who had gone to college, were estranged from him. Some of his closest running partners in high school moved away from him after they went to college and he stayed on the block. Now that I was also in college, I did not want to move away from the Street Brothers as Walter's friend had done. That is why, when I was not studying or in class, I was down on the block with the Righteous Brothers. I think one of the reasons why I, in particular, had so many fights was because I weighed only about 130 pounds. You got a lot of prestige from being able to fight the hefty guys who first gained their reputation by downing late lightweights like me. There were not many others as small as I was who looked the big ones in the eye. I had an added a disadvantage. All the way through school, my baby face made people think I was younger than I was. I resented being treated like a baby. And to show them I was as bad as they were, I would fight at the drop of a hat. As soon as I saw a dude rearing up, I struck him before he struck me, but only when there was going to be a fight anyway. I struck first because a fight usually did not last very long, and nine times out of ten, the winner was the one who got the first lick. Sunny Man was very good with his hands, and he taught me how to hit hard in spite of my light weight. Most of the other guys really did not know how to hit, so I always fired first and knocked them out, or at least knocked, him, knocked the tooth out, 
or close an eye. Finally, I got a reputation as a bad dude, and I did not have to fight as much. Every once in a while, however, one of the, the Tush Hogs, our name for a bad, tough street fighter on the block, would change, would challenge me. After the fight, we usually became really good friends. That happens all the time <laughs> because he would realize that my features were deceiving. Sometimes I got into teaching on the block, reciting poetry or starting dialogues about philosophical ideas. I talked to the brothers about things that Hume, Pierce, Locke, and James, William James has said. And in that way, I retained ideas and sometimes resolved problems in my own mind. These thinkers had used the scientific method by applying their ideas to particular formulas. They excluded those things that did not fit into the formulas. I explained this to the brothers and we talked about such questions as the existence of God, self-determination and free will. I would ask them, do you have free will? Yes. Do you believe in God? Yes. Is your God all powerful? Yes. Is he omniscient? I think I said that wrong, that word wrong. Yes. Therefore, I told them their all-powerful God knew everything before it happened. If so, I would ask, how can you say that you have free will when he knows what you're going to do before you do it? You are predestined to do what you do. If not, then your God has lied or he has made a mistake. And you have already said that your God cannot lie or make a mistake. These dilemmas led to arguments that lasted all day. Over a fifth of wine, they cleared my thinking, even though I sometimes went to school drunk. Some of the brothers thought I was a pendant putting them down. Fights started occasionally over an imaginary insult, especially with newcomers to the group who did not know me or my relationship to the brothers. I liked talking about ideas, and street brothers were the only ones I wanted to be with at the time because I liked the things we were doing, standing on a corner, meeting people, watching the women, and relating to those who struggled for survival on the block. Rap sessions like this took place all over, in cars parked in front of the liquor store on Sacramento Street near Ashby and Berkeley, outside places where parties were being held, and sometimes inside. I told them about the allegory of the cave from Plato's Republic, and they enjoyed it. We called it the story of the cave prisoners. In the cave allegory, Plato describes the plight of the prisoners in a cave who received their impression of the outside world from shadows projected on the wall by the fire at the mouth of the cave. One of the prisoners he freed and gets a view of the outside world, objective reality. He returns to the cave to tell the others that the scenes they observed on the wall are not reality, but only a distorted reflection of it. The prisoners tell the liberated man he is crazy, and he cannot convince them. He tries to take one of them outside, but the prisoner is terrified at the thought of facing something new. When he is dragged outside the cave anyway, he sees the sun and is blinded by it. The allegory seemed very appropriate to our own situation in society. We too were in prison and needed to be liberated in order to distinguish between truth and the falsehood imposed on us. The dudes on the block still thought I was out of sight and sometimes just plain crazy. One of the reasons for the crazy label was because I always did the unexpected, a valuable practice in keeping your adversary off balance. If I knew that some guys wanted to jump on me, I would go where they hung out just show up by myself and challenge them right on the spot. Many times they were too shocked to do much about it. This street philosophy also crept into my academic work. The brothers were hostile toward the police because they were always brutalizing and intimidating us. So I began to study police science in school to learn more about the thinking of police and how to outmaneuver them. I learned how they conducted investigations. I also began to study law. My mother had always urged me to do this, even in high school, because I was good at arguing points, and she thought I would be a good lawyer. I studied law first at City College and later at San Francisco Law School in San Francisco Law School in San Francisco. Not so much to become a lawyer, but to be able to deal with the police. I was doing the unexpected. One day in 1965, I was as I was walking across Grove Street to the college, I saw a white man sideswipe a brother's car. A motorcycle cop came up, and the two drivers entered into an argument over who was wrong. The cop was about to write a ticket for the brother. I had been standing there with the other people watching the incident and walked over to the white man and told him that he was wrong. Angry at this, the cop told me to be quiet because I was not involved. I came back at him and told him that I was involved because I knew how, the, how he treated people on the block. The fact that he had a gun, I said, did not give him the right to intimidate me. 
the gun did not mean anything because the people were going to get guns of their own and take away the guns of the police. I ran these things down to him in front of all the people. That was the first time I stood a policeman down. Grab some water. Um, oh, this is uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, 1840 quote. What is property? Property is theft. And then a quote from oh, these names. Bakunin, maybe, probably pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> 1870. The brigand is the true and only revolutionary. I need to look that word up because I don't recognize it. Scoring. I first studied law to become a better burglar, figuring I might get busted at any time and wanting to be ready when it happened. I bought some books on criminal law and burglary and felony and looked up as much as possible. I tried to find out what kind of evidence they needed, what things were actually considered violations of the law and what the loopholes were and what you could do to avoid being charged at all. They had a law for everything. I studied the California Penal Code and books like California Criminal Evidence and California Criminal Law by Frick and Alicorn. Hmm, probably said that wrong. <laughs> Concentrating on those areas that were somewhat vague. The California Penal Code says that any law which is vague to the ordinary citizen, the average reasonable man who lives in California and who is exposed to the, sta the state's rules, regulation, and culture, does not qualify as a statute. Later on, law enforcement courses helped me to know how to deal with the police. Before I took criminal evidence in school, I had no idea what my rights really were. I did not know, for instance, that police can be arrested. My studying helped because every time I got arrested, I was released with no charge. Until I went to prison for something I was innocent of, I had no convictions against me, yet I had done uh, a little of everything. The court would convict you if it could. But if you knew the law and were articulate, then the judges figured you were not too bad because you, your very manner of speaking indicated that you had been indoctrinated into the way of thinking. I was doing a lot of things that were technically unlawful. Sometimes my friends and I received stolen blank checks from a company, which we would then make out of $150 or $200, never more than an amount consistent with a weekly paycheck. Sometimes we sold the checks ourselves. Other times we bought them from guys who had stolen them. You had to do this fast before the companies distributed checks, numbers to banks and stores. We burglarized homes in Oakland and Berkeley Hills in broad daylight. Sometimes we borrowed a pickup truck and put a lawnmower or garden tools in it. Then we drove up to a house that appeared empty and rang the bell. If no one answered, we rolled the lawnmower around to the back as if we planned to cut the grass and trim the hedges. Then swiftly, we broke into the house and took what we wanted. Often I went car prowling by myself. I would walk the streets until I saw a good prospect, then break into the car and take what was on the seat or in the glove compartment. Many people left their cars unlocked, which made it easier. We scored best, however, with the credit game or short change games. We stole or bought stolen credit cards and then purchased as much as possible with them before their numbers were distributed. You could either sell the booty or use it yourself. A very profitable credit game went like this. We would pay $20 or 30 to someone who owned a small business to say that we had worked for him for five years or so. This established a work record good enough for credit in one of the big stores. Then we would charge about $150 worth of merchandise and pay $20 down. Of course, we used an assumed name and a phony address, but we let them check we let them check the address because we gave them a location and telephone number where one of our friends lived. We made payments for a couple of months. Then we would charge over the 150 limit. If you were making payments, they raised your credit. We would buy a big order and then stop making payments. If they called our place of work, they were told we just quit. If they called our alleged address, they learned we had moved over a month ago. The store was left hanging. They did not really lose because they were actually robbing the community blind. They just wrote off the amount and continued their robbing. The lesson? You can survive through petty crime and hurt those who hurt you. Absolutely. Once into petty crime, I stopped fighting. I had transferred the conflict, the aggression, and hostility from the brothers and the community to the establishment. The most successful game I ran was the shortchange game. Shortchanging was an art I developed so well that I could make $50 to $60 a day. I ran it everywhere, in small and large stores and even on bank tellers. 
in the short change game, I could go into a store with five $1 bills, ask the clerk for change, and walk out with the $10 bill. This was the five to 10 short change. You could also do a 10 to 20 short change by walking to the store with the 10 $1 bills, with 10 $1 bills, and coming out with $20 bill. The five to 10 short change worked this way. You folded up four of the bills into a small tight wad. Then you bought something like candy or gum with the other bill so that the clerk had to open the cash register to give you change. I always stood a little distance from the register so that the clerk had to come to me to give me the change. You have to get the cash register open and get the clerk to move away from it so that his mind is taken off what he has in the register. When he brought my change from the candy, I handed him the wad of four $1 bills and said, here are five singles. Will you give me a $5 bill for them? He would then hand me the $5 bill before he realized that there were only four singles in the wad. He has the register open and I am prepared for him to discover the error. When he did, I would then hand him another single, but also the five. Oh, but also the $5 bill he had given me and say, well, here's six more, give me a 10. He would do it and I would take the $10 and be gone before he realized what happened. Most of the time they never understood. It happened so fast, they would simply go on to another customer. By the time things began to click in their minds, they would never be sure that something had in fact gone wrong until the end of the day when they tallied up the register. By that time, I was just a vague memory. Of course, if the clerk was quick and sensed that something was not right, then I pretended to be confused and would say I made a mistake and gave him the right amount. It was a pretty safe game and it worked for me many times. The brother who introduced me to shortchanging eventually became a Muslim. But before that, he taught me to burglarize cars parked by the emergency entrances of hospitals. People would come to the hospital in a rush and leave their cars unlocked with valuables in the open. I never scored on blacks under any condition, but scoring on whites was a strike against injustice. Absolutely. Whenever I had liberated enough cash to give me a stretch of free time, I stayed home reading books like Joke. These these names, y'all. Dostoevsky. I said that so fucking wrong. Crime and Punishment. I know that book. <laughs> the Devils in the House of the Dead. The Trial by Franz Kafka and Thomas Wolfe's Lock Homeward Angel. I read and reread Lost Miserables by Victor Hugo. The Story of Jean Valjean, <laughs> and a. Oh, I'm sorry, a Frenchman who spent 30 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his hungry family. This really reached me because I identified with Velagine and I often thought of my father being in a kind of social prison because he wanted to feed his family. Albert Cumas, the stranger in the myth of Sisyphus, made me feel even more justified in my pattern of liberating property from the oppressor as an antidote to social suicide. I felt that white people were criminals because they plunged they plundered the world. It was more, however, than a simple anti-white feeling because I never wanted to hurt poor whites, even though I had met some in school who called me nigger and other names. I fought them, but I never took their lunches or money because I knew that they had nothing to start with. With those who had money, it was a different story. I still equated having money with whiteness and to take what was mine and what the white criminals called theirs gave me a feeling of real freedom. I even bragged to my friends how good I felt about the whole matter. When they were at my apartment during times when there wasn't any food to eat, I told them that even though I starved, my time was my own and I could do anything I wanted with it. I didn't have a car then because most of my money was spent on the apartment, food, and clothes. When friends asked me why I did not get a car, I told them it was because I did not want bills and that car was not my main goal or desire. My purpose was to have as much leisure time as possible. I could have pulled bigger jobs and gotten more, but I did not want any status symbols. I wanted most of all to be free from the life of a servant forced to take those low paying jobs and looked at with scorn by white bosses. Eventually, I got caught, and more than once, but by then I had developed a fairly good working knowledge of the law and I decided to defend myself. Although no skilled legal technician, I could make a good defense. If you are an existentialist, defending yourself is another manifestation of freedom. When you are brought into the courts of the establishment, you can show your contempt for them. Most defendants want to get high price counsel or use the state to speak for them through the public defender. If you speak for yourself, you can say exactly what you want. 
or at least not say what you do not want to, or you can laugh at them. As Elaine Brown, a member of the Black Panther Party, says in her song, The End of Silence, you laugh at laws passed by a silly lot that tell you to give thanks for what you've already got. The laws existed to defend those who possess property. They protect the possessors who should share, but who do not. By defending myself, I showed my contempt for that structure. It gave me real pleasure to defend myself. I never thought in terms of conviction or acquittal, although it was an added treat to escape their net. But even a conviction would not have dismayed me, because at least I had the opportunity to laugh at them and show my contempt. They would see that I was not intimidated enough to raise the money to get counsel, money that I did not have in the first place, or to accept a public defender. I especially like traffic violations. For a while, I paid a lot of traffic tickets. When I became my own defender, I never paid another one. Of the three major cases in which I defended myself, the only one I lost was the one in which I was innocent. Once, I was indicted on 16 counts of burglary through trickery as a result of the short change game. And I beat the cases during the pretrial period because the police cannot establish the, the corpus delis. I do not know how to say that either, y'all. Sorry. Or the elements of the case. Each law had a body of elements, and each element has to be violated in order for a crime to have been committed. That's what they call the corpus delicity. I, I know I butchered it. People think that term means the physical body, but it really means the body of elements. For example, according to California law, in order to commit armed robbery, you have to be armed, and you must be expropriate. Oh, I'm sorry. You must expropriate through fear to or force related to weapons. You can have armed robbery without any bullets in the gun. The elements of the case relate to fear and force in connection with weapons. In the short change or bunco case, I was accused of running my game in 16 stores. However, they could get only a few people to say they were short in the registers. I was really saved from being convicted because the police tried to get a young woman teller from a bank to say that I had shortchanged her. A lot of people will not admit that they have been shortchanged. In the pretrial, in which they were trying to get a federal case, they asked me whether I had gone into the bank. I refused to admit it. I knew that the young woman whom they wanted to testify against me had not shown up at court. When I bailed out, I went to her bank and asked her if the police had been there. She said they had and that they were trying to persuade her that I had shortchanged her. She said she could not testify because she knew it had not happened. I invited her to court to testify on my behalf. She came and explained to the judge that the police had tried to persuade her to testify, but she would not comply. My argument was that the police had, had invented the short change rap against me. I pointed out that clerks who were short changed would have missed the money either uh, would have missed the money either when I was in the store or at the end of the day. None of these people hadn't notified the police. The police had sought them out. And by suggesting that they have been shortchanged, we're really offering the clerks a chance to make five or ten extra dollars, a sort of payoff for testifying. Most people, I said, are not as honest as the young girl bank teller. Another argument I put forth in my defense was that if someone else had gotten changed after I have been in the store before an inventory of the register, it was quite possible, even probable, that the money had been lost at some other time. I got a dismissal on the grounds of insufficient evidence. In the second major case, I was accused of having stolen some books from a store near the school and of having burglarized the car of another student and taken his books. He reported to the bookstore that his books had been stolen. They were on the, on the lookout for books with the marking he had described. I had not stolen the books even though they were in my possession. I was doing a lot of gambling at the time and some students who owed me money gave me the books instead. We used books for money because if a book was required in a course, we could sell it to the bookstore, even though I did not know where the bookstore or where the books came from. I suspected that they were stolen. I figured that was about sixty dollars worth of books in the stack. When I needed money, I sent my cousin to the bookstore to cash them in. The bookstore took them away from her, claiming that they were stolen. They would not give her any money, nor would they return the books. I went down to the store and told them that they could not confiscate my books without due process of law. They knew I was a student at the college and that they could call the police on me any time they wanted. I told them that they either return my books or they either return the books right then or I would take as many books as I thought would equal the amount they had stolen from me. 
they gave me the books and I went on to class. Apparently, the bookstore notified the dean of students who called the police. While I was in class, the Oakland police came and escorted me with the books to the campus police who took me to the dean's office. No one could arrest me because there was no warrant. The bookstore wanted to wait until the man who had reported the book stolen returned from the army to identify them. So they took me to the dean's office and the dean said he would give me a receipt keeping the books until the owner came back. I told him that he would not give me a receipt because they were my books and he could not confiscate my property without due process of law. To do so would be a violation of my constitutional rights. I added, furthermore, if you try to confiscate my property, I will ask the police over there to have you arrested. The police still looking stupid, not knowing what to do. The dean said the man would not be back for about a week, but he wanted the books. I took the books off his desk and said, I'm enrolled here, and when you want to talk to me, I'll be around. Then I walked out the office. They did not know how to deal with the poor, oppressed black men who knew their law and had dignity. When I was charged and brought to trial, I defended myself again. The case revolved around identifying the books. The man knew his books had been stolen. The bookstore knew they had lost some books. Identification had not been made, but I was charged with the theft. I had stashed the books away so that nobody could locate them, and when I came to court, I left them behind. They brought me to trial without any factual evidence against me, and I beat the case with the defense I conduct conducted, particularly my uh, cross-examination. The woman who owned the bookstore took the stand. The previous year, on Christmas Eve, she had invited me to her home, and I had seen her off and on after that. When I was unwilling to continue a relationship with her, ooh, she became angry. I wanted to bring this out, but when I began this line of questioning, the judge was outraged and stopped it. By this time, however, she had broken down in tears on the stand, and it was apparent to the jury by the questions I asked and her reaction to them that she had personal reasons for testifying against me. When the dean testified, I really went to work. Although no books were entered into evidence, he said that I had in my possession some books identical to those on the list the day the police brought me to, to his office. I asked him, well, if the police were right there, why didn't you put me under arrest? He said, I wasn't sure of my rights. This was the opening I needed. And I said, you mean to say that I attend your school and you're teaching me my rights without even knowing your own? You're giving me knowledge and you don't know your basic civil rights. Then I turned to the jury and argued that this was strange indeed. The judge was furious and almost cited me for contempt of court. I was in contempt, all right, and not only for the court, I was contemptuous of the whole system of exploitation which I was coming to understand better and better. I knew what the jury was thinking, and when the dean said that he did not know his rights, I used his ignorance to my advantage. People automatically think, you mean you're a college professor and you don't know something that basic and simple? Once I planted this idea in the minds of the jurors, it completely negated the dean's testimony. I told the jury that I collected books, which I did, traded and sold them, and that I had some volumes similar to those named in the indictment, same names, authors, and so forth. When they, when they wanted to view the books, I asked the judge if I could go home and get them. The judge said that he could not stop a trial in the middle, it was a misdemeanor case, to let me go home. My strategy worked, however, and I ended up with the hung jury. Then came the second trial. This time, I had the books in court, but nobody could identify them. I had acquired some different books, some authors and same names, but some similar markings in them. Uh, the man who claimed his car had been burglarized, the dean and the owner of the bookstore, could not positively identify them. They kept saying that the books were either similar or the same, but they were not sure. I emphasized this uncertainty, saying that all I knew was I had purchased the books from another person. I told the jury that I had not in fact stolen the books and that by bringing them to court, I was trying to find out if they belonged to those who had brought the charges. I got another hung jury. They tried, to, they tried me a third time with the same result. When they brought the case up a fourth time, the judge dismissed it. Off and on with continuances and mistrials, the case dragged over a period of nine months. It was simple harassment. And as far as I was concerned, because I had not stolen the books, they might also have been trying to test my new uh, prosecutors, to test new prosecutors. I had a different one every time, every chump in Alameda County, and still they got nowhere. I looked them straight in the eye and advanced. 
The third case came out of a party I attended with Melvin at the home of a probation officer who had gone to San Jose State College with him. Melvin had known some of the people at the party quite a while, and most of them were related to each other in some way, either by blood or by marriage. Melvin and I were outsiders. As usual, I started a discussion. A party was good or bad for me, depending on whether I could start a rap session. I taught that way for the Afro-American Association and recruited a lot of the lumpens. Some of these sessions ended in fights. It was almost like the dozens again, although here ideas, not mothers, were at issue. The guy who could ask the most penetrating questions and give the smartest answers capped or topped all the others. Sometimes after a guy was defeated or shot down, if he wanted to fight, I would accommodate him. It was all the same. If I could get into a good rap and a good fight too, the night was complete. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> at that, at the party, while we were talking, someone called Odell Lee came up and entered the conversation. I did not know him, had only seen him dancing earlier in the evening, but I had gone to school with his wife, Margot, who was there. Odell Lee walked up and said, you must be an Afro-American. I replied, I don't know what you mean. Are you asking me if I am of African descent or are you asking me if I'm a member of Donald Warren's Afro-American Association? If the latter, then I am not. But if you're asking me if, I am, if I'm of African ancestry, then I am an Afro-American, just as you are. He says some words in Chinese and I came back in Swahili. Then he asked me, well, how do you know that I'm an Afro-American? I replied, well, I have 20-20 vision. <laughs> I have 2020 vision and I can see your hair is just as kinky as mine and your face just as black. So I conclude that you must be exactly what I am, an Afro-American. <laughs> Talk that shit. <laughs> Saying that, I turned my back and began to cut my steak. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> he's so fucking funny. <laughs> I was the only one in the room with a steak knife. All the others had plastic utensils, but since the steak was kind of tough, I had gone into the kitchen for a regular steak knife. Having made my point, my move, so to speak, I turned my back on Lee in a kind of uh, put down. To him, it was a provocative act. Although had, Odell had a scar on his face from about the ear to just below his chin. This was a very significant point because on the block, you run into plenty of guys with scars like that which usually means that the person has seen a lot of action with knives. This is not always the case, but when you are trying to survive on the block, you learn to be hip to the cues. So I turned my back and began cutting steak with the knife I had in my right hand. He grabbed my left arm with his right and turned me around abruptly. When he did, my knife was pointed right at him in ready position. Lee said, don't turn your back on me when I'm talking to you. I pushed his hand off my arm. Don't you ever put your hands on me again, I said, and turned around once more to my stake. Ooh. Ordinarily, I would not have turned my back a second time because he had all the signs of a tush hog, but somehow the conditions did not add up. Most people there were professionals or training to become professionals, and this man with the scar did not seem to fit. We were not on the block, so I thought perhaps the scar meant nothing. All of a sudden, however, he was acting like a bully, and now he wanted everyone to know he was not finished with me. When I turned my back on him a second time, this would have ended the whole argument for the black bourgeois, but the tush hog responded in his way. He turned me around again, and the tempo picked up. You must not know who you're talking to, he said, moving his left hand to his left hip pocket. I figured I had better hurry up, since the best defense is a good offense. My, snake, my steak knife was, again, in a ready position, instinctively. I said to him, don't draw a knife on me. And I thrust my knife forward, stabbing him several times before he could come up with his left hand. He held on to me with his right hand and tried to advance, but I pushed him away. I still do not know what he was doing with his left hand, but I was expecting to be hurt any time and determined to beat him to the punch. Melvin grabbed Lee's right arm and pushed him into a corner where he fell, bleeding heavily. He got up and charged me again, and I continued to hold my knife ready. Then Melvin jumped between us, and Lee fainted in his arms. As Melvin took the knife from me, we turned to the rest of the people, and somebody asked, Why did you cut him? Melvin said. He cut him because he should, cut ha because he should have cut him, and we backed out of the room. Melvin wanted me to press charges against the man, but I would never go to the police. 
About two weeks later, Odell Lee swore out, uh, swore out charges against me. I don't know why he delayed so long, perhaps because he was in the hospital for a few days. Maybe he was hesitant. He had been talking about getting me. I know, but I also heard that his wife had urged him to press charges instead. To me, he was not the kind of character who would go to the police. I saw him as a guy who would rather look for me himself and deal right there. When he, when he sent word that he was after me, I started packing a gun. Instead, I was arrested at my house on a warrant and indicted for assault with a deadly weapon. After I pleaded not guilty and went to a jury trial, I defended myself again. I was found guilty as charged, but only because I lacked a jury of my peers. My defense was based on the grounds that I was not guilty, either by white law or by the culture of the Black community. I did not deny that I stabbed Odell Lee. I admitted it. But the law says that when one sees or feels he is in imminent danger of great bodily harm or death, he may use whatever force necessary to defend himself. If he kills his assailant, the homicide is justified. This section of the California Penal Code is almost impossible for a man to defend himself under unless he is a part of the oppressor class. The oppressed have no chance for people who sit on juries always think you could have picked another means of defense. They cannot see or understand the danger. A jury of my peers would have understood the situation and exonerated me. But the jurors in Alameda County come out of big houses in the hills to pass judgment on the people from whom they feel threaten their peace. When these people see a scar on the face of a man on the block, they have no understanding of its symbolism. Odell Lee got on the stand and said that his scar resulted from an automobile accident. It may well have. But taking everything in context, his behavior at the party, the mood toward his left hip, and his scar, my peers would have, my peers would ha would never have convicted me. Bobby Seale explains it brilliantly and sees the time. You may go to a party and step on someone's shoes and apologize, and if the person accepts the apology, then nothing happens. If you hear something like an apology won't shine my shoes, then you know he is really what he's really saying. I'm going to fight you. So you defend yourself, and in that case, striking first would be a defense act, not an offensive one. You are trying to get an advantage over an opponent who has already declared war. It is all a matter of lifestyles that spill over into the problem of getting a jury of one's peers. If a truck driver is the defendant, should there be only truck drivers on the jury or all white racists on the jury if a white racist is on trial? I say no. There is nevertheless an internal contradiction in a jury system that totally divides the accused and his jury. Different cultures and lifestyles in America use the same words with different shades of meaning. All belong to one society, yet live in different worlds. I was found guilty of a felony, assault with a deadly weapon, and faced a long jail sentence for the first time. Before and during the trial, I had been out on bail for several months. I came to court each time I was supposed to, but when I was convicted, the judge decided to revoke my bail immediately and place me in the custody of a bailiff while he considered what sentence to impose. Wanting none of this, I demanded to be sentenced right then. The judge said that if he sentenced me then, I would be sent to the state penitentiary. I told him to send me there immediately so that I could start serving my time. He refused, asking me, do you realize what you're saying? I said, I know what I'm saying that you found me guilty, but I am not guilty. And I know, I'm sorry, and now I don't want to wait around a month serving dead time while you think about it. No time was dead to me. It was all lifetime life. I felt that if the judge wanted to think about it for 30 days, he should let me stay out on bail while he did so, but he would not. He had me confined to Alameda County Jail, a place I would get to know very, get to know well, very well. While I was waiting, my family hired a lawyer to represent me at the sentencing. The judge was a man named Leonard Deaton, uh, who did not give lawyers, much less defendants, any respect. He has sent so many people to the penitentiary that a section of San Quentin is called Deaton's Row. I was against my family hiring a lawyer because I felt it was useless. Nevertheless, they did, and he charged him $1,500 to go to court one time. When I arrived for sentencing, he was there and he worked his white magic. The judge sentenced me to six months in the county jail, even though I had been convicted of a felony. The time they gave me was for a misdemeanor. This was to become a critical issue in my later capital trial because the law says you can reduce a felony to a misdemeanor by serving less time. 
The penalty for a felony is no less than a year in the state penitentiary and no more than a life sentence or death. For a misdemeanor, the maximum is one year in the county jail. I'm going to go ahead and stop there because I think I've been going like over an hour. So, yeah, I'm going to pause it right there. I don't know if y'all want to have a discussion. I'm probably uh, going to grab some food. If y'all want to grab a mic, please feel free. Or if like y'all want to open up your own space, I'll definitely be in there too for the same discussion. Either way, it's, it's copacetic. So since I don't see any requests, I'm going to go ahead and end the space. And I'm going to try to pick up tomorrow when I get back in Houston. So I want to thank all y'all for coming. And yeah, I hope it makes y'all feel like how it makes me feel. This shit gets me energized every fucking time. But you know what it also does? It like affirms to me that, yo, I'm not fucking crazy. <laughs> or if I'm crazy, it's okay to be. <laughs> so I, I love reading this book over and over again. It, it just it just reaffirms me. And also, too, it just tells me to keep going. You're on the right path. So I hope it does the same for y'all.